Hello, welcome to the Twin Cities Jewish Film Festival closing weekend. My name is Riv Shapiro and I'm the new arts and culture producer at the Minnesota JCC and the producing director of this festival. And it is my great honor and privilege to welcome Hadar Cohen to be with us this evening. Hadar is a Mizrahi feminist, multimodal artist, healer and educator. She is the founder of Feminism All Night, a project that designs communal immersive learning experiences about feminism and spirituality. Hadar is a Jewish mystic who works to build decolonial frameworks for worshiping God. You can follow her work at hadarcohen.me or on Instagram at hadarcohen32. Welcome, Hadar. I'm so excited to have you, and especially for this film. I thought of you right away because of your family's history and the work that I know you've been doing to integrate parts of yourself that are posed as separate identities in the film. So thank you so much for being here. And could you start off just by telling us about your family? Sure. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. And um, yeah, excited to partake um, in this event. And um, yeah, so my name is Hadar Cohen. I was born in Jerusalem um, and my family really comes from all over the Middle East. So um, my grandparents from my mom's side are um, from Kurdistan. They were born in a small village um, in Northern Iran um, and they immigrated to the state of Israel in the early 50s. And then from my dad's side, um, my grandmother has been in Jerusalem for 10 generations. So we come from very deep Jerusalem roots. And my grandfather is from Aleppo, from Syria. Did you always know as much as you know now about your ancestry or what was your process of kind of uncovering these lineages? Yeah, it's a good question. You know. It's interesting because I think it also is different on my mom's side and my dad's side. Like my grandmother um, has this epic family tree and just knew everything about everyone dating back like hundreds of years, like their whole love life, their whole stories. So she just like kept everything like written and, you know, there was just so much um, lineage tending. Um, so I always had like grew up with a lot of stories from my grandmother, from my dad's side, from the Jerusalem lineage. Um, and from my mom's side, you know, it's something that I'm still kind of thinking about a lot because um, I just grew up with so much shame around my identity, especially like being a Kurdish Jew and what that means. And, you know, especially even in relationship to like my dad's family, who was, you know, like Syrian Jerusalemite um, and that just like felt cooler or something. So I'm like, I think I'm still learning so much about like my Kurdish roots. And I think it's also, you know, kind of a different thing because my grandparents like don't talk at all about um, their experience and their lineage in Kurdistan. Like they just completely, like every time I asked about it, they were just like, we don't talk about it. Um, so it was also just, you know, this very different um, ways that my grandparents were relating to their own history. Um, so, but, you know, I think that, so I was born in Jerusalem and when I was 10, um, we moved to New Jersey to the States. So I had like a whole confusing <laughs> upbringing, um, because when we landed in America, I, you know, we were mostly in an Ashkenazi Jewish community and, um, I didn't even really know like what it meant to be Mizrahi or anything like that. I, um, yeah, and it was like a huge culture shock also with like speaking English and just American culture and all of that, um, you know, in some ways like classic immigration experience. So I was very confused about my identity for probably most of my life. Um, and I think that when my grandmother died um, from my dad's side, um, the one who tended to the lineage as well, like that's when I felt kind of... Um, a stronger responsibility to understand myself and understand who I am and understand where I come from. Um, so I, yeah, started kind of um, tending more and gathering more resources and especially like, you know, all the documents that my grandmother kind of put together. I was like, okay, we need to preserve them. We need to, um, you know, like I was, it's something that came up for me a lot because, you know, my parents at that time were still in New Jersey and 
when my grandmother passed, it was like, there was no one left in my lineage, including, you know, my dad's siblings in Jerusalem. And it was just like this shocking experience all of a sudden, because I was like, wow, like this is like the end of a, like I, if I'm not there, it's like the end of this lineage in some way. Um, and, and yeah, just kind of like really feeling what that means to have such a deep connection to place and all of a sudden, you know, have the generations change and, and have um, that like lack of connection again. So I think, you know, so much of my work has been like, okay, what is this connection to land that's also through ancestors um yeah thank you for sharing and it just it makes me think it's so relevant to the film because one of the ways that we most preserve our culture i think and our connection to our ancestors in diaspora is through food and you're speaking to this um seeing a lineage end, seeing seeing traditions possibly dying out, wanting to preserve them. And that's really a core theme of the festival in this film as well, the Asham's Food Festival, as well as bringing people together from across, you know, cultural borders. Um, it's also really about preserving these ancestral dishes and these recipes. So in a, a way, keeping these ancestors alive and keeping these traditions alive. So I'd love to know just how did you relate to the film? What was it like for you to watch it coming from Jerusalem and also having Syrian lineage and lineages from all over the Middle East? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I think that for so many cultures, like food is, you know, just what we gather around. This is how we come together. This is how we unite. This is how we talk about things that don't talk about things. Um, and, you know, I think that it's so like the film was really beautiful because it really showed how we can um, really do that, how we can engage in food and culture, but also kind of bring, you know, the different sides of us that are from that. And um, it's funny because for me, it's like I am, I don't really love cooking. So I always like rely on other people to kind of cook for me. Um, but that was like a big loss all of a sudden when my grandmother died where I was just like, okay, like I never learned how to cook these Syrian dishes. So like, are they just going to be wiped out? But I think that actually so many people are actually, especially around Israel, Palestine, like are really bringing in, like, how do we actually preserve food culture and preserve ancestral remembrance and, um, you know, what is, what is actually kind of happening also with the state of Israel and how, we can actually like bring, um, not just like create something new altogether, but actually honor like the ancient and what was, you know, what people are bringing from their different lineages and different traditions. Um, and I think that it's like, especially with, you know, Arab food, which Arab food I think is like so amazing in so many ways. It's like just so delicious, but um, yeah, there's so much around also like beauty and aesthetics. And, um, you know, I think that sometimes it hasn't gotten as much, especially with like the world, the international world, it hasn't gotten as much attention as like, you know, the best foods coming out. But actually, like, I think what was really beautiful about the film is just like showing how unique this, these dishes are, how thoughtful they are, how much um, love goes into making them and, um, yeah, that was really inspiring to watch. Were there any foods that you felt a lot of connection to that were familiar for you or that you were like, I have to go try this next time I'm in Jerusalem? Well, I think um, there was this one guy who was talking about, um, I'm forgetting, it was like in the scene in Haifa, but um, about the Syrian dish that how the young people, you know, especially kind of like what's cool to kind of eat on the streets is not necessarily kind of like the older stuff that people were eating like 200 years ago. And a lot of those dishes are being forgotten. And he's specifically talking about like Syrian dishes. And I actually think that a lot of like Mizrahi um, families like have really in some ways preserved that. Like my, you know, like I, I think they mentioned this dish like sofrito, which is, um, I had a very like Spanish influence in Syria, but, um, but yeah, I like grew up eating so much of it. And like, for me, that was like the normal food, but 
then you know when you go to like an arab cafe like they don't necessarily like serve that because it's kind of like an old school syrian dish um so you know kind of this um the old and the new and, and and you know what are we actually kind of remembering and bringing forward so i really love that kind of conversation and, and what is it like to actually you know revive some of these um foods that you know are a little bit older too and you're speaking to kind of exactly why i wanted you to be present for this film and to to share your voice because here you are a jewish woman who you related to a dish in the film that was from the quote-unquote arab side so i saw that in the film jewish and arab were kind of set up as a binary identities and i I understand why that's so and why it's kind of the simplest, easiest way to talk about bringing people together in the state of Israel. And I know that it's not true for many people that those are separate identities. So could you speak a little bit to how you have struggled with and embraced and integrated knowing that you identify as Syrian and you identify with Arab cultures and you're a very powerful Jewish educator and healer and artist. Yeah, thank you for that question. Well, first I just wanna start by saying that it's been a journey <laughs> because I, you know, like now I speak about it more and I started writing a little bit more articles about it as well, about what it means to claim an Arab Jewish identity. Um, but it really, it took so much healing and so much um, internal confusion because um, as you said, it's like really, you know, I grew up in Jerusalem. So, you know, all the time it's like talking about how do we get Arabs and Jews to get along, you know, and psychologically that does something to you because then it paints Arabs on one side and then Jews on the other side. And then you're like, where do I belong? <laughs> you know, like which camp am I in? Um, and, you know, also being in the States, I think has been difficult because, um, you know, in Jewish community, when we th talk about like what it means to be Jewish, we're largely talking about Ashkenazi Judaism or European Judaism, you know, even what we see in the media or like Jewish representation is like constantly very Ashkenazi based. So even as, when I do, you know, multi-faith work, it's like, and I show up as an Arab Jew, it's like always confusing for people because they're in, in their minds, it's like to be Jewish is, connected to being European and all of that. Um, so I always felt like, you know, in some ways being like a walking contradictory person. <laughs> like I was like, where, who are my people? Like, where do I belong? Um, you know, as if like Jewish people don't struggle enough with belonging. Um, but yeah, I think in recent years, I've really found um, that actually like, I feel so at home in Arab culture, whether it's Jewish or not. Um, and, and that has been really transformative for me because I think I was taught for all these years that like, okay, you know, especially like under the state of Israel, it's like, that's the homeland, that's, you know, the place to be. But I found myself also like longing for Syria as the homeland and like for Aleppo and like really thinking about like, well, what was Jewish life there? And, you know, like, maybe that, that is my Jewish homeland too. And, um, and, and I think that the more I started speaking out about it and the more I started building actually connection with non-Jewish Arabs, it's been so healing for me because um, I think that Jewish people, you know, have always been part of the Arab countries, of Arab culture, of Arab tradition. I mean, we've contributed so so much to music and cultures and food and all of that so you know it's definitely like a huge trauma i think that mizrahi jews have faced um to basically like not belong in both camps right um but i think that the healing work for me has found thing that actually like both of these communities are my home and actually like i can claim both as my communities and um i don't have to choose and I think that some of the work in the education that I try to bring on is that, you know, how do we make Jewish communities um, more diverse and understand that Jewish people are actually like multiracial, multiethnic, come from all over the world. And there's so many beautiful traditions that come from so many different places. 
Um, and also, you know, with the Arab world and with the Arab communities, like how do we really heal um, the way that um, Jewishness has been forgotten from that region and actually like um, bring it back over there too. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing about that. And one of the themes in the film is also, you know, how do we form connections between these cultures and reform them, right? It's talking about a vision for coexistence in the future, but I know that having 10 generations in Jerusalem, your family has actually lived that coexistence. So could you tell us any stories that you have from your ancestors about living in mixed Jewish, Arab, Muslim, Christian, just what, what that was like in Jerusalem before the state of Israel and, and how you relate to that now? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I grew up with a family that was just like completely obsessed with Jerusalem. Like everything was Jerusalem. Like I remember actually like when I um, moved to the States and I was very young, I was like 10 and people would ask me where I'm from. I would say like, you know, at first I would say Israel and then it would be like, well, where in Israel? And I would think that that question was so silly because I was like, where else could you be from other than Jerusalem? Like, I literally didn't know that there are other places to be from other than, like I knew conceptually, but it just also didn't make sense. So like everything in my family was just like so much love and so much care for Jerusalem and its history. And um, yeah, especially my grandma, like she was like completely in love with the city. Um, and yeah, even like actually right now, it's like, I'll show you, I have this little um, notebook that I use that is all the gates of Jerusalem. So I'm like, I have all these like Jerusalem pictures in my wall in LA. So I'm like trying to um, keep that love for Jerusalem alive. Um, but I think that, you know, I think something that I struggled with sometimes, especially being in the States is that, um, you know, sometimes in Jewish community, we talk about Israel and specifically Jerusalem a lot because it's in our prayers and all of that. And it's obviously a very, um, has a lot of um, Jewish significance. Um, but I always struggled because, you know, people would talk about Jerusalem as the homeland and from like, you know, this Jewish spiritual perspective. But then for me, it actually also was like my physical <laughs> homeland, you know, it was like actually where I was actually from. And that was something that I always kind of um, had to work through because I, I felt like I had a different connection to Jerusalem than um, the way that a lot of Jewish people, especially in the diaspora, were talking about Jerusalem. Um, so I think that, you know, the love that I grew up with for Jerusalem, when I like kind of feel into like, what is that love and what is that about? Um, it is, you know, like, I really think of Jerusalem as like the spiritual capital of the world. Um, this is like such a sacred, holy site. Um, it's also, you know, in some traditions known to be like the cent like the literal center of the world. Um, so many prophetic traditions are born out of there. And um, for me, you know, I, um, definitely am a mystic and um, in practice, you know, devotion to the divine and the sacred and um, Jerusalem to me, like really was, like embodies all of that. Um, and, and I think that I, um, you know, just, it just like makes the most sense for that to be shared by all of humanity because we're all actually creators of the divine. Um, but, you know, obviously, like Jerusalem faces so much violence and so much segregation and so much separation between cultures and races. And, you know, it's one of the most diverse cities, but people don't interact with each other because everything is so segregated. And um, there's so much pain in that. And I think my whole life, I've just been um, in that, like in that beauty of like multi-faith devotion to the sacred, and then also understanding the pain and the violence and the separation um, that also like Jerusalem holds and, and, and learning what that means to hold them together. Um, but yeah, and I think that, you know, I, I really too try to kind of um, bring forth the love that my grandmother had for Jerusalem, which was really, really deep. Um, she grew up um, with my grandfather in the old city um, and yeah, I'm just like, wow, like, what was it like growing up in the old city? But 
um, you know, she would tell me sometimes stories that, um, you know, when she was 10, I think she was 10 when the 67 war happened. And um, she would always, you know, like go to school and then she would go to like her Muslim neighbors for just, you know, snacks, after school snacks and just to, you know, hang out. And they would always have like dessert and food together. And then, um, you know, that was just like her usual routine. Like after school, she would just go to her friend's place. And then after the war, um, you know, she would go there just like she usually does. And then um, her friend's mom was like, actually, you can't come here anymore. And I remember my grandma said that to me and I just like felt that like, oh my God, like to have like, especially as a child, when you're just like used to just playing and, you know, being silly, having snacks. And then all of a sudden having this like, oh, like no more um, is really, really harsh. And um, and yeah, I could I could see, see how like that pain still lived on. And it's, you know, interesting for me because I was 10 when I moved um, to New Jersey. And part of the reason why we moved is because it was a second intifada. And, um, you know, Jerusalem was a pretty like violent place at that time. So it's just to, you know, think about my experience and my grandma's experience and um, these moments of kind of rupture between communities. Um, but, you know, I think that what I believe is that, um, you know, the way that we heal is through reconnecting to the love and especially the love of the land. Um, so this is why I'm like trying to really like continue on that lineage, that lineage of like, what does it actually mean for Jerusalem to like really be who she's supposed to be, which is supposed to be this divine feminine city too, you know, like of, of um, worship and of prayer and of, um, yeah, just like multi-faith community. Beautiful. And I think that food is one of the ways that we connect to our love for the land because we are literally taking the land into our bodies and in an active exchange of sharing material matter with, with the earth. So mm -hmm. yeah, is there anything you wanna speak to about the role of food or connecting over food in this healing work that you're talking about? Yeah, well, I think it's exactly what you said that food is our connection to between the body and the land, you know, like our bodies are made of the land and, um, and when we eat, like we're literally eating the land and, and we're getting reconnected and, um, you know, I think part of my hope is that um, we actually use these spaces um, where we dine together to actually like talk about that, talk about what lands are we from, like what lands made our bones and our bodies. And, and to me that matters, right? Like, especially as we're talking, you know, we're living through a time of such global displacement, um, but like our bodies still very much hold ancient memories of um, where we're actually from. Um, and I think that conversation is really, um, really powerful. So, um, yeah, I think that for me, it's just like, okay, well, how do we use food as a way to engage in this deeper conversation about displacement and ancestral memory and, you know, what lives in our bodies, whether it's the beauty or the trauma or all of that, um, and actually use food as a space for, for that connection. Thank you. And yeah, I think that is, that is what they're getting at with Asham's Food Festival is really when it comes down to it, we're all humans, we're all bodies that need to eat to live. And it's a way to bring us to the table so that those conversations are possible. Mm -hmm. And so may it be so that, that we continue to come together and find what unites us on a really basic level so that we can find what unites us on more and more levels and rebuild that world of, of interweaving and connection and sharing the land, sharing the beauty of Jerusalem and the surrounding area together. Yeah, amen. Yeah, I mean, I think that food is meant to be shared, right? Like, I mean, our experiences, we're just, we're meant to live in a, um, 
a space where we share with each other. And I think that, you know, where it gets tricky is when there's unacknowledged power differences and dynamics um, where, you know, um, yeah. So I think that it, it's both. It's like important to have both of these conversations. It's like, okay, well, how do we engage in a space of like sharing and really like allowing people to experience different cultures? And, you know, I bring my culture, you bring your culture and we can have a feast together. Um, but we also have to have the conversation of like, okay, well, what happens when it's not just sharing, but there's actually some dynamics of power and injustice that are happening um, and I think that those, like, you know, that conversation can happen within that space that we're talking. Um, I think it's actually essential. Like, we can't leave that part out. Um, so, but again, it's like, you know, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I love about the Middle East is that, like, so many of us, like, we just don't have a filter. <laughs> like, we just speak, like, whatever is on our minds. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes for better or for worse, but um, this way of like, um, we really need to like talk. We have to talk in a deep way, right? Not just like ranting thoughts, but like actually speak and talk and, and share about our experience and our lived reality and, and be very honest about that. Because I think like without that deep level of authentic speaking, like we don't even really know what's happening, right? So, um, you know, when we're nourished and when we're fed, we actually have more capacity to like hear someone else. Um, so I think that that's in some ways my prayer is just like, how do we actually like use these spaces of beautiful food to um, make space for like a deeper form of listening to each other and to, um, yeah, the lived experience that people have. Amen. Thank you so much, Hadar. Thank you for being here. And again, folks can check out your work at hadarcohen.me or on Instagram at hadarcohen32. Thank, Thank you, you, and I hope our viewers will join for the rest of our closing weekend. We have a special event coming this Sunday. Check it out. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Riv, for having me. And thank you, everyone, for watching.